Hey, my name is uh, Byron Cook. I'm director of Automated Reasoning Group. I'm really excited to introduce uh, Mark and Aaron uh, from uh, Millennium who are going to speak about their use of some tools that come from my team. Um, I thought I'd just pr provide a few moments of context about where, where this work is coming from uh, to, to help uh, Mark and Aaron then um, pitch it. So. Um, so my, my team builds tools in the space of what we call provable security. So this is the application of mathematical logic to uh, prove properties about uh, AWS systems and also to provide tools to customers to prove properties about, about, about their systems. Um, so we, uh, we, we develop tools that answer questions about the future behavior of systems, so software, or so uh, source code, policies, networks, protocols, et cetera, and we talk about what those systems might do, what they will do, what they can never do. Um, we work on tools both that are customer facing and also internal, so, so customer facing, we have, we, we, we have a couple of tools, one called Tiros, one called Zelkova, that's gonna be mentioned today, and those power a number of features in AWS services, so for example, S3's um, block public access, also inspectors, network reachability analysis, also IoT device defender, and config rules has a number of Zelkova-based managed rules, so the, the list goes on. So these are, these are um, engines that use mathematical logic to reason about networks, to reason about policies. And then below the um, line of the shared security model, we're also doing a number of proofs about the crypto, about the virtualization uh, uh, storage, you name it. So we're proving uh, properties related to security, durability, uh, and also using these tools to reduce the, our internal costs for compliance audit. Um, the, the big idea is that um, reasoning about programs formally is undecidable. The halting problem, for example, is undecidable. Or uh, reasoning about, um, uh, for example, the, the, the um, SAT problem for propositional logic is actually NP complete. But we have techniques that, that in practice make those problems feel decidable or P time. And so we, there, are, there are some uh, practical tools that for, for, non, for, for, for applications that come from developers and industrial applications, we can make NP feel like P time often or make the undecidable feel decidable and we apply those, apply those tools to, to practical problems. Um, so, said that, talked about that. Um, if you want to know more information uh, in general about provable security, uh, there's the AWS Security Provable Security webpage that has blog posts, it has scientific papers, it has um, uh, a podcast that I'm running, um, uh, et cetera. So, and there's also recorded talks. And, and including a number of recorded talks from Reinforce, which was a couple of uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. So with that, I'm going to hand over uh, control of the uh, slides and to our friends from Millennium, and they'll tell us all about their work. Thank you, uh, Byron. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Horda. I'm the uh, head of cloud engineering for Millennium Management. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a system we uh, develop internally to manage IAM roles and permissions at the enterprise scale. Uh, but more importantly, we're going to talk to you about how we leverage some of the tools that Byron mentioned, and uh, specifically how we leverage AWS Alcova to achieve provable security within our infrastructure, within our uh, cloud environment, and to get confidence on the roles and the things that we're doing in the cloud. First, let's talk a little bit about Millennium. So we're a global management firm, uh, investment uh, management firm, uh, roughly around 38 billion uh, under assets in, in management, uh, and 2,800 uh, employees across offices of the United, in the United States, Asia, and Europe. We have a large number of specialized trading teams, which don't necessarily talk to each other. They're very, very specialized, and their use cases are very, very unique which makes our job, the public cloud team, a little bit more difficult than some of the other use cases that you might see. As a result, we have, within the public cloud team, we have two sub-teams. One of them is the enablement team, and these are the girls and the guys who actually do all the work for the public cloud. They're, they're amazing. They actually partner with uh, the customers, 
they learn about the use cases, they learn about their environment, and then they go out and build all of this architecture in a cloud-native way. Then we have the engineering team, and the engineering team is just simply uh, uh, our responsibility is to build this tooling, this framework, this ecosystem of, of cloud, uh, cloud tooling uh, that allows the, uh, not only the enablement team, but all of the other application teams to onboard onto AWS easily. And the goal was just really to make it very simple, uh, very developers uh, friendly, and also, uh, also uh, not add a lot of friction into the daily work. So we tried to be as frictionless as possible in our tooling. The motivation for getting into AWS was simple. We needed elasticity. We needed time to market. We want all these independent teams to innovate quickly. right? That's just the typical cloud use case. Um, security is a uh, primary concern for us. So uh, we build security into every component, into every resource that we, that, that we create. Uh, and is a first-class citizen within everything that we do at, at Millennium, including our tooling, our frameworks, our CICD pipelines. We start with the security requirements first and then work backwards until we get a component or a resource that we feel confident that meets our security policies. We also make it very easy for new application teams to onboard by creating these application templates. And an application template is a typical uh, canonical implementation of a particular use case. Let's say, for example, that you want to build a three-tier web app, then you know that you're going to need an Elastic Load Balancer, you're going to need auto scaling group, launch config, RAW 53, DNS entries, you're going to need an RDS. Uh, all of that is made in a, in a uh, automated function and deployed into their account via pipelines using the application templates. From that point on, then it's up to the development team to actually expand on that particular use case. They could tweak it, they could add different things, but you know, the starting point is, is there and is uh, well-defined and, and proven. <clears throat> we have hundreds of accounts within Millennium. Um, we operate in a multi-account strategy. Um, so it's up to the development team or this, the, the new customer when they're on board to decide what the deployment strategy should be. Uh, and it depends on the number of environments that they want. Sometimes they might want just a dev, QA, um, UAT, alpha, beta, prod. You know, they define that. And then within those definition of those environments, then they further define whether they want one account per environment or they want dev and QA in the same account within the same VPC, dev and QA in the same account, but in separate VPCs. So it's, it's all driven by a framework that, that we've built internally. We're using uh, AWS uh, extensively on Millennium. Uh, our primary use case is compute and big data. But over the last six months or so, we're starting to see a lot more of the uh, machine learning uh, use cases. Um, heavy users of uh, EKS, of uh, AWS Bash, uh, Lambda, um, and of course, EMR, uh, Spark, uh, SageMaker is coming into the picture now, Athena, S3, of course. Nobody can use AWS without using S3. We have uh, our own internal cloud framework that we started to build two years ago. We actually showcased uh, this framework at reInvent last year in 2018. Um, and, and basically, all we're doing with this, with this framework is uh, adding all of the guardrails to protect these development teams from, from doing something that we're not um, comfortable in the cloud, right? Um, so it is very, very opinionated. Um, but within that, we give you enough flexibility to just turn enough knobs to get it optimized for your particular use case. We also have our own internal uh, security framework, and it's actually called Piranha, and I, I bet you guys know why it's called Piranha, because it's very aggressive, it's looking for blood, and it attacks it when it sees it. Everybody has been hurt by Piranha in our organization, that's for sure. Um, but but it's, it's, it's based on the traditional methods for validating security, right? Um, we, de we employ all of this, um, all of these detective controls into, into our account. So we monitor everything, and we have 
we're looking at cloud trail, we're looking at cloud wash, we uh, AWS config, for example, once we see an event, we will fire a Lambda function. In some cases, it might be as simple as, as just saying, let me send you a, a, a warning. In other cases, we'll try to remediate the, uh, uh, the issue. And if we can remediate it, we're gonna kill the resource immediately. That's just as easy as, as it is. Uh, but another thing is like, as Byron was mentioning, a lot of these tools already, like AWS Config, for example, Guard Duty, S3, they're already being powered by AWS Alcova. So that's why we started to look into, into implementing this ourselves. The business challenge was easy. We have a multi-account uh, structure. We want to take away the ability for our customers to create IAM roles, so we wanted to centralize that and create a service that did that for you. And by doing so, we, we are getting guarantee consistency across all of our accounts. We know that when we deploy a role, it is, it is actually across all of our accounts, and, and then we added versioning uh, to those roles. So when we deploy a role, when we deploy a, a policy, it is versioned. And by virtue of being versioned, then that gave us the capabilities of doing rollbacks. So in the event that we deploy something that was a mistake, it's very easy to roll back to a previous state, uh, something that we couldn't do before. And also, as we mentioned, we have over 200 uh, development teams. Um, we, we wanted to reduce the complexities of building IAM policies. It's very, very difficult to build a good IAM policy. It's not a trivial thing to do. Even for us who are like cloud security engineers, that's that's very time-consuming and complicated thing. Um, there are a lot of attributes in an IAM policy, and sometimes when you combine them together, you get a policy evaluation that is not necessarily what you were thinking you were gonna get, right? So you get something that is not expected. We wanted to eliminate that as well. So we created sort of like a, another language internally that allows you to sort of craft these policies in, in a much easier and secure way. But then we started, as we got deeper and deeper in, in building uh, this, um, this service, we started to, to ask ourselves a question. Wait a minute, you know, uh, on, a, on AWS policy is not just for IAM, right? There's, there's many different resources where you have resource-based policies. So what are we doing with that? Do we know what we're doing with those, with an S3 bucket policy, with a VPC endpoint policy? So we started to look at that as well. So, well, might as well employ the same thing that we're doing for IAM policies with all of the other resource-based policies, right? We're versioning roles, but how do we know that the new version is more permissive or more restrictive? It could be that it should be more permissive because we're adding functionality to the system, but we, by hand, you really can't tell. So this system is allowing us to figure this out and understand this type of thing, right? And then how do we prove it? How do we ensure that these policies are correct, right? Yeah, we could use an IAM policy static analyzer but they mainly do like heuristic checks. They're not gonna do much more. We could hire a team of UAT uh, uh, people that goes out and checks every single policy manually. That doesn't scale, that doesn't scale at the enterprise level. Uh, so we needed something else, right? And that's what AWS Alcova came into the picture, right? Um, what is AWS Alcova? Simply, simply put, AWS Alcova is a service from AWS that allows you to validate an IAM policy and its properties. That's basically what it does. There's no magic. It doesn't do any magic tricks. It doesn't do anything crazy. But it does use proven mathematical methods and semantic-based reasoning to accomplish that. That is the key, right? It's based on mathematical proofs. So what we are getting out of it at the end is provable security in the cloud. Another thing is that since we started to use this system, I hear that our cloud security engineers are sleeping better at night just because we have this provable security. So I would recommend that. They'll be your friends. So what, what you know, yeah, so we started to build this system. What was the main goal? The main goal was that we wanted to remove IAM APIs from every single customer and every single user. We don't want you to create or have any access to IAM roles or IAM APIs. Uh, so we did that. We, we removed them from every account. Uh, 
Then we needed to say, well, there's still that risk of privilege escalation, right? Because you have assume role and you have pass role. So how do we do that? Well, we deploy tighter controls on the roles that you can assume and the roles that you can pass. And we, we added all of these conditions to make sure that you can only pass certain roles to certain services when they made sense. And, and that's how we started to tie down the system. And then we're using Selkova to validate what we're doing, the cloud security and the, cloud, and the public cloud team, uh, when we build and deploy these roles into your accounts. Of course, we, we, we have a large ecosystem of, uh, of cloud tools within Millennium, and we needed to make sure that the services that we were creating seamlessly integrated into that ecosystem. And these are some of the integration points that I'll go in a, in a, into a few minutes. But the main thing that we got from this exercise is that we were able to shift this IAM policy validation all the way to the left, all the way to the beginning. So we're now, instead of being reactive with the Piranha network for IAM policy, we're now being very proactive because we're not gonna deploy a role unless Sokova tells us that that role is compliant. Um, we'll go into really deep details into how we do that in, a, in, in the next few slides. And as a result, now we're achieving, you know, uh, provable security within our, uh, within our accounts. So let's, let's look at some of this architecture uh, that we have. During account creation, uh, we, we send a message to the account provisioning service, and this is a service that is responsible for not only creating the account, but setting all the, the guardrails and the controls, enable CloudTrail, right, all of the good stuff that you guys do already. This is a service that is doing it for us. Uh, we built it in, in internally, uh, but as part of that now, we're calling the role creation service. Uh, the role creation service then is gonna deploy or create every single role that is needed by that particular target account to operate successfully going forward. Uh, before that was done either manually or the cloud security guys had to, had to do that manually, which was a pain and it's error prone. Now we've eliminated that aspect, right? Next, we say, okay, now imagine if you're a development team, you're gonna start creating application roles, service roles, right? Uh, so through our framework, uh, when you create a pull request and that pull request is merged, uh, we automatically create uh, or, or kick off uh, a code pipeline. And that code pipeline has a stage which is the code build. And within code build, You'll do all of the typical things that you do in an application, run your unit test, compile, do this, do that. But one of the things that we're doing in there is we're reaching out to the role creation service because we see that you want to create a role or that you want to update or modify an existing role, right? The role creation service then reaches out to Selkova, sends Selkova to individual uh, a control policy and the policy that you're trying to create and then very simply, so Alcoa would tell us whether that role is actually compliant or non-compliant. If it is compliant, we'll go ahead and deploy that role into your target account uh, via CloudFormation, and then contact uh, CodeBill saying, hey, go ahead and continue through the pipeline. And then of course, since we're using CloudFormation, now those roles are available for other CloudFormation stack via imports. And you know, again, the, uh, the, uh, this happens when you're actually doing a pull request. So imagine that, we're doing validation at code time. Uh, you're not gonna be able to, to merge that if, if this doesn't, if this doesn't um, uh, if, if the role that you're trying to do is not compliant. And the last one that we integrated, and this is actually uh, still in the works, but we use it internally, um, is through a REST endpoint. So a developer, imagine a developer that is just onboarding onto, onto uh, our system. Uh, or even an existing developer that wants to use a, a new service, like Lake Formation, for example, a SageMaker, something that we haven't implemented yet. Uh, well, they, start, they could start crafting those IAM policies way up front before they write a single line of code, and then we go through the same process, right? We'll go ahead and call the role creation service, call Selkova, and then you get immediate feedback whether the policy that you're trying to craft actually is compliant or is non-compliant. And furthermore, you'll get uh, details as to why that role is not compliant. It will tell you this API is being blocked by this SCP, by the service control policy. 
So now you know that you have to go ahead and contact InfoSec and say, hey, why do I have this uh, you know, API being blocked by the service control policy? Uh, very powerful. This is my favorite uh, integration point, actually. Uh, now I'm going to bring Aaron uh, Fagan to the stage, and he's going to show you everything about uh, Selkova and policies and everything else. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, my name is Aaron Fagan, Principal Cloud Security Engineer with Millennium Management. And I'm gonna take you through the details of the solution. Um, my goal at the end of this is that you have all the building blocks that you need if you wanna go out and create the service yourselves internally. So uh, how do we go about creating and, and validating all of these disparate IAM roles at, at scale across hundreds of accounts and uh, different use cases? What are some methods that we could use uh, to validate those roles and policies? So there are some traditional methods. Uh, I'm sure many of you have used these. You, you can do ma manual code reviews. So maybe someone from uh, the cloud security team or InfoSec sits down with a developer. And it's a very high bandwidth communication. The developer knows exactly which APIs are going to be approved or, or not approved for their particular role. Uh, but it's very time consuming. We can do uh, static code inspection, as, as Mark alluded to, uh, set up some, some rules, uh, codify those, and perhaps call those as part of uh, your CI CD pipeline. We can put in uh, detective controls that look at the configurations of these policies, inspect them after the fact, and uh, potentially automatically remediate them. And we can use service control policies uh, so we can get a nice warm and fuzzy feeling about the security of our account uh, because it limits the APIs that any principal in the account can execute, in including root. Uh, so it's very powerful. And uh, as Mark said, helps, helps the cloud security engineer sleep at night. Um, but we can also use some provable methods, and, and this is what, uh, what Byron talked about with AWS Zelkova. Uh, one of these is IAM boundaries, which is powered by Zelkova. So we can attach an IAM policy to a role, and we can limit the APIs that that role can execute, regardless of what's in its IAM policy. So if we attach a boundary to a role that has administrative access, it's still going to be limited uh, by that boundary. Uh, we can use the Compare Policies API, and I'm going to dig into this uh, quite a bit more later. And uh, there's the Policy Checker API from Zelkova. And so you can uh, spot check certain configurations and attributes of policies. Uh, as, as part of that API. Now, we're going to focus primarily on IAM, uh, but Zelkova does support uh, evaluating resource-based policies. So think of services like uh, S3, SQS, SNS, very powerful. And so when we take these uh, high bandwidth uh, communications, uh, traditional methods where we get feedback about uh, what APIs are approved and not approved, and we combine those with the high confidence provable methods that we can get from Zelkova, we achieve what we like to call informative provable security. And the reason why that's important is we need to get feedback to our developers so that they can iterate on their policies without having to necessarily interact with another team, or at least if we can reduce those interactions so they can iterate on their own, uh, it increases their agility and they can deploy that much faster. All right, so let's get into the, what, what, what we're actually doing here. Um, there's two types of roles that we need to create uh, to support this service. And, and Mark alluded to these earlier. Uh, one set of roles uh, we call CI-CD pipeline roles. And these support the service in the target account we'll be creating IAM uh, resources in. Okay, so we need certain hooks into that account to be able to deploy roles. And these are some of those that we need to stage as part of that account provisioning process. Uh, so we create an AWS cloud formation role. And so this role gets used by uh, the developers to create uh, any non-IAM resources uh, for their applications. There's an AWS code build role that the users pass to code build and an AWS code pipeline role that users pass to code pipeline. We also create a role creation service deployment role. Now this is the role that creates the IAM resources, but the users don't have access to that. 
It's leveraged by our service uh, from the centralized services account. But ultimately, what we're trying to create are application service roles. And what we mean here are these are roles that are passed uh, to AWS services as part of uh, developer applications. So think EC2 instance roles, Lambda service roles, things of that nature. Again, those are created by the role creation service deployment role. And then they're referenced in user applications uh, as CloudFormation imports. Okay, so uh, just putting some more detail behind uh, what uh, Mark had shown earlier, we have those rules there, and then we also need to grant the users permissions to leverage those rules that we stage in the accounts. So let's take a, a look at um, uh, how we do some of that. Uh, what we're looking at here is the a representation of the step function branch that's responsible for creating the CI CD pipeline roles and also updating those user permissions, uh, as I talked about. So let's look at this uh, Lambda function that actually creates the roles and, and just look at, at a high level what it's doing. So from the centralized services account, uh, we generate a prescribed policy for each of these roles. And then we do a cross account role assumption into the target account, create those uh, CI CD uh, roles, and then create AWS uh, parameter store parameters so that we can version those roles. After that's done, we wait for IAM eventual consistency. Uh, we do a, a verification that the role was created successfully and it has the policy that we intended to apply to that role. And once that's done, we move on to uh, the last step, which is to update the user permissions. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at that Lambda function. Inside of there, um, what we're looking at here is the, the user permissions uh, IAM policy, where we're gonna grant access to that cloud formation role we've um, staged in the account. And so what we need to do is allow them to, to pass that role to cloud formation. But the IAM pass role permission is, is very sensitive. So unrestricted, you could potentially escalate your privileges by passing um, perhaps like an administrative role to an EC2 instance and using that to uh, escalate your privileges. And we, we certainly don't want that as part of our service. Uh, so we put a resource restriction because we created this role um, so that they can only pass the CloudFormation role. We also add a condition uh, so they can only pass that role to the CloudFormation service. Similarly, on the CloudFormation role itself, uh, we restrict the uh, Assume role API uh, to only the CloudFormation service. And so Assume role is just as sensitive as the pass role, so we need to secure that side as well. All right, so we're ready to start creating application service roles and target accounts. We've staged our CI CD pipeline roles. We've updated the user permissions. Uh, so let's look at what, um, what this process looks like. Um, so just to remind you, this is, this is the uh, workflow. And this is a representation of the step function branch of the role creation service that creates these application service roles. The first thing I wanna talk about is how we've taken a uh, working backwards approach to uh, the requests that go into, uh, the, de the developers um, send into the service in order to request these roles. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So using our framework, uh, the developer creates a YAML file similar to what you would see here. Uh, so we're creating an EC2 role. Um, this would be passed to the EC2 service. And uh, we've provided some baseline policies. Um, so there are certain uh, APIs that uh, we noticed uh, many developers are using, innocuous APIs, uh, things like um, being able to utilize the uh, KMS keys that we stage in the account, like, like Werner uh, spoke about today, uh, the bring your own key model. Um, being able to write to CloudWatch logs. And so the, the one line of code here where we're listing the default role policies for an EC2 instance was actually 174 lines of JSON. And we didn't see any reason why developers needed to write that over and over and over again. Uh, they, can, they can just add that one line and, and they get those baseline policies. But of course, the, the baseline policies aren't going to uh, fulfill every use case, and you don't want to make those uh, too generic. 
And so we have a, a simple way to request additional APIs. Uh, you can list actions and resources and conditions just like in a, a normal uh, uh, IAM policy. There are certain services that require um, AWS managed policy ARNs to be attached. Um, and so we have a, a, a section here where you can do that. Uh, one of those is Amazon EKS. Uh, and so here we're uh, requesting the Amazon EKS worker node policy also be attached to this role. And so you can see this is very simple, it's very easy to read, uh, and it helps developers out quite a bit when um, trying to put together and construct these uh, IAM policies. All right, so we've sent in our request, and now we're really gonna get to uh, the heart of the service, which is the evaluate service role policy lambda function. Okay. So uh, the inputs to this are the, uh, the requested role, and uh, the Lambda then lo looks at our uh, rules engine and generates a control policy for that role type. So if we're uh, requesting an EC2 instance role or a Lambda role, there's gonna be a control policy uh, that limits the permissions that are uh, allowed for that particular uh, functionality. We send both of these into Zelkova. We compare the requested role against the control policy, and if Zelkova determines that that is a compliant policy, we go ahead and create that role. We, we just move on. Uh, in the event that uh, that role is determined to be non-compliant, we do some additional logic on that to generate why that role is non-compliant, right? Because we wanna get that fast feedback to the developers so they can iterate on their roles. Because ultimately, we want them to be able to deploy their applications. Uh, and so uh, we use uh, the IAM Simulate Principal Policy API, which I will talk about uh, more later. We also have our own uh, custom logic secret sauce that we supplement uh, that simulation with. And then we send those results uh, to the policy compliance result and get it back to the developer. Okay, so, so let's look more at uh, how we use Zelkova and uh, some examples of how to use that API. So as I mentioned before, we use the Compare Policies API and uh, it's very similar to the diagram I just showed you. You, you. It accepts in a policy to evaluate and a control policy to evaluate it against. Send those in as inputs, and we get some sort of comparison result. Uh, there's a few different states uh, that that result can have. Uh, more permissive, less permissive, incomparable, and equivalent. And we'll walk through some examples uh, to illustrate some of those states. Okay, so here's a, a sample uh, policy request. So you can imagine this is coming in from a developer. Now these are extremely simple policies, uh, just meant to illustrate the, the functionality of Zelkova. And there's only so much room on the slide for, for, uh, for a policy, but I think it illustrates the point. Uh, so in the requested policy, we have an allow put object and S3 get object with a resource of star. Um, Anyone, has anyone ever seen like a S3 star in your, uh, your policies? Just a show of hands, anyone who's, yes, many. Um, <laughs> that's kind of what we're trying to avoid here. Um, now, in this case, we have a, a resource of star. In the control policy, uh, we have an allow put object, S3 get object, for a particular resource, my bucket. If we send these into Zelkova, we're going to get uh, a result of more permissive. And so what this is telling us is that the requested policy that was sent in has more permissions, is more permissive than the control policy. So in this case, in the, in the role creation service, we would not create that role. Let's look at another example. Uh, in this case, the requested policy is allow S3 put object now we have a, a resource restriction for my bucket. Our control policy is allow S3 put object and S3 get object uh, for uh, the resource my bucket. If we send these into Zelkova, we get a uh, comparison result of less permissive. And so what this is saying is that the requested policy uh, has fewer permissions than the control policy. And that's because the get object API appears in the control policy, but not in the requested policy. This is good, right? It's less permissive. And so in this case, we'd go ahead and create that role. 
Okay, one more example. This is a tricky one, uh, so, so follow along. Uh, our requested policy is effect allow for S3 delete object API for my bucket. The control policy is, uh, again, allow S3 put object and S3 get object uh, for the resource my bucket. So if we send these into Zilkova, we get a result of incomparable. Okay, so what does this mean? So if I look at uh, the control policy, it's allowing for S3 put object and S3 get object, but those APIs don't appear in the requested policy. And so in that way, the requested policy is less permissive. That's good, we want less permissive. But the requested policy includes the delete object API, and it does, that does not appear in the control policy. And, and so in that way, the requested policy is also more permissive. If it's more permissive at all, in any way, than the control policy, uh, we're not gonna create that rule. Okay, so now we have our Zelkova result. Um, in the cases where uh, that policy is determined to be non-compliant, we want to uh, generate, as I mentioned, the feedback for the developers so that they know how to modify their policy in order to, to be compliant. Um, and so let's take a look at uh, the simulate principal policy API and uh, how we use that to generate some, some of that feedback. And you'll notice that the inputs to the simulate principal policy API are very similar to Zelkova. Uh, it accepts in a, a proposed action list and a resource list. Um, so this would be like our requested policy. And so we decompose that in the code in, into these lists. Um, it also accepts in the, the same control policy. And then it attaches that uh, control policy to the role and evaluates each of those actions and resources against that policy to see if they would be permitted or not. And the result that it kicks back is, uh, are the, the evaluation results. And we'll, we'll take a look at what exactly these look like. Uh, so, so we have more examples. Uh, so here we have an action list of EC2 create volume uh, with a resource list of star. Our control policy is allow EC2 instances star. And if we send this into the simulate principal policy API, we're going to get a, a JSON uh, result like, uh, like this. And so what this is saying is we have an eval decision of an implicit deny. Basically what that's saying is the create volume API that we requested doesn't appear in the control policy and so it's being implicitly denied. So you can imagine the developer, uh, when they get this feedback, they can remove that uh, from their policy if it's not really needed, and, and then they can move forward. If it is needed, then they may need to take a, a different action, reach out to the Cloud Enablement team or the Cloud Security team. Uh, another example, here we have EC2 create NAT gateway as our action, requested action, and a uh, resource list of star. In our control policy, we have, again, allow EC2 describe instances. We send this into the simulate principal policy API call, and I, I know you all know that we're gonna get an implicit deny. Uh, you can tell that create that gateway is not in the, in the list of the control policy. But this is interesting because uh, there's some additional information in the evaluation results JSON. So we see there's this organization uh, decision detail allowed by organizations is false. Okay, so what this is saying is not only does it not appear in the control policy, but we're also denying this by service control policy uh, at the organization's level. And so perhaps there's a different team that you would need to interact with in order to uh, whitelist that API. And so we can give that information to the developers as well. One more example. Uh, here we're requesting an action of S3 put object for the resource my bucket. I love that my bucket. Uh, in the control policy, uh, we uh, have an effect allow of S3 put object on the corp bucket. Send those in, and our evaluation results come back. Again, we're getting an implicit denied here, but we have some additional information again. The resource specific results uh, indicate that we're getting an implicit deny on a particular resource, my bucket. And so if the developer has this information, perhaps they can uh, modify this to use a compliant bucket. 
All right, so we have all this valuable feedback. We're gonna manipulate it in code to make it look very nice and, and read readable and pretty. Uh, so what does that feedback look like to the developer? There's three different ways they can get this feedback. Um, as Mark mentioned, they can do ad hoc uh, submission of these, these policies uh, to the API gateway. They can get it on merge uh, in GitHub. And of course, we're going to enforce this in the CICD pipelines where uh, the applications are being deployed. And so here's an example of the code build logs uh, for a particular request. Uh, if we're, it indicates there we're creating a stack uh, for the roles called EKS cluster. We're creating three different roles, uh, the EKS IAM cluster role, the EKS IAM worker role, and the EC2 role. Uh, we would list uh, the event um, that was sent into the service and also the, the response. There's just only so much space in here. And what we're really interested in uh, is the green text which indicates that, yes, we were successful in creating uh, each of these three roles, and then that code pipeline would proceed on to uh, deploy those application templates that reference those roles. Happy green check mark, and away we go. Uh, another example of, how about a non-compliant API? So we're, we're requesting something that, an API that doesn't appear in the control policy. And so this is what the developer sees. Your API EC2 create volume was denied because it's not in the approved API list. That, that's valuable feedback. We're even telling them who they need to contact if uh, they don't want to remove that API. You can imagine, again, if I have a very large and complex uh, IAM policy, there could be several of these APIs. So one of the things that I just want to mention is we evaluate the entire policy. We don't find the first failure and then exit out. Um, this is not, not really helpful for the developer, right? So we evaluate every API, we put all of those results in, and they would get all of these for the role. So if they're gonna remediate, they can remediate all of those things, and then their policy should be compliant. They, they do it once and they move on. Here's what the feedback looks like uh, if we're uh, missing a resource restriction or there's an incorrect resource restriction on one of those APIs. Uh, so API S3 put object was denied because the API is approved, uh, but not for the following resources, right? So what we're telling them is uh, if they can just modify that resource to, the, to, the, uh, to one of the approved buckets, they should be, should be good to go. Similarly for, for like a KMS request, if they request decrypt for uh, a key they're not authorized, uh, we're, we're telling them that and who to, again, who to contact for assistance. And here's an example of the feedback that they would get if an API is denied by a service control policy. Um, here we're, we're blocking the API EC2 create internet gateway um, by service control policy. Um, certainly that's a, an avenue for data exfiltration. And so it looks like here uh, that's being denied at the account level. Okay, and I, I think you can see how we've taken the uh, provable methods, the compare policies API of Zelkova, it gives us high confidence that the roles we're deploying are secure, but we're combining that with some of the more traditional methods of static code inspection uh, and feedback to the developers because they're our customers and we want them to be able to deploy applications and we wanna help them deploy applications securely. So um, what are some lessons learned from, from this process? Uh, the first one would be scale your security team. Uh, so so if, you, if you haven't uh, run into this yet, you will. Uh, if you're doing manual code reviews, and um, that can be very, very time consuming, and it's an arduous process. And so if you find some way to codify those rules, um, it, it'll go a long way to, to allowing your cloud security engineers to move on to other parts of your infrastructure that they can secure. Um, if you build it, they will come and comply. And, and, and so this really gets to, it's, it's relatively easy to create very restrictive policies, right? You, we can lock down using service control policies, we can make every API unavailable and we'll be very secure, uh, but it's not gonna be very functional. And, 
so what we really tried to do is design the service from the developer's perspective, but make it secure, right? So if we make it easier for them to comply than not comply, they'll comply, right? So if we do things like simplifying the way that they construct these policies, if we give them feedback that allows them to iterate on those policies without having to meet with us uh, to tell them basically what it says in the code build logs, uh, they're gonna be happy, we're gonna be happy, everyone's gonna move faster, the business is happy, everybody's happy. It's, it's the way to go. Uh, finally, leverage Zelkova to ensure provable security. I can't stress this enough. Uh, having gone down the path of uh, static code inspection and you know, trying to verify every attribute and every uh, different portion of these very, very complex policies, uh, it can be very, very challenging, and inevitably, inevitably, there are going to be gaps. There are new services released all the time. Uh, it's just really incredibly difficult to, to design these rules uh, to be that dynamic. And Zelkova makes it extremely easy. You saw what we do. You take a policy. You have another policy. You compare them. You send them into the API. It takes two inputs. I mean, it, it doesn't get any easier than that. Um, and it's just... Um, it's been a fantastic way to uh, simplify how we um, verify that the roles we're creating are what we intended. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark to talk uh, a little bit about our roadmap and uh, what's coming up next. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. So uh, if you want to learn a lot more about Selkova, there's actually a great white paper um, on the website that uh, Byron alluded to before that. Uh, I'm sure you can find it in Google, too. It's called um, Semantic Based Reasoning for AWS Access Policies Using SMTs. And it goes into great details behind the SMT resolvers and all of the open source tools and the way they actually do the math and the proving uh, within Selkova. And if you like math, plenty of Greek letters in there as well. So what's up for next, though, for, for us? What's next for us? Um, we, I guess, address the problem of uh, IAM policies. Uh, but now, as I was mentioning before, there's a lot more than just IAM policies. There's a lot of resource-based policies within AWS that we want to tackle next. So we're going to extend our, our use of Selkova to all of the VPC endpoints. There's actually another API called the Policy Checker API that we have not been using. Uh, and that's a, actually a really great API uh, because it comes with a lot of rules built in into it already, uh, but also gives you an extension point that you can build your own rules. So we're looking to use that extensively uh, in the next iteration of this service. And then additionally, we want to use Tiros. We, we, we're now doing very good at IAM policies. We'll implement Sokova in other areas, but still the networking is not something that we can say we have provable security. We really have to do a lot of detective controls to make sure that when we deploy an EC2 instance, it's not reachable from, from the outside of the company. And that's where Tiros comes into play. So we want to leverage uh, the other tool from the uh, ARG group, which is called Tiros, into our other services that we have. We have many, many services. One of them is the VPC provisioning service, for example, that basically creates VPC for our clients and does all of the networking. Uh, we want to make sure that Tiros is backing that service so that we can feel more comfortable with uh, the resources that we're deploying onto those VPCs are not actually are, are secure and are not reachable from outside of, uh, of the company, from outside the internet, or the other way around as well. Um, and that's about it. I would recommend that you guys use Alcova. Uh, it is a service that is already being used internally at Amazon and at AWS to power all of their security. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's a win-win situation. As you saw from Aaron, it's extremely easy to use. Uh, it doesn't require that much effort to get on board. It. And uh, these guys are coming out with more and more rules that will make you feel more comfortable when you go to bed at night. Um, we'll take uh, questions, and, uh, questions uh, now, I guess, uh, later. 
uh, here uh, on the side of the uh, on the side of the uh, <laughs> of the stage. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, so please fill out the surveys. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we got, I got to show you this. Uh, yeah, you got to do that. <laughs> cannot you cannot leave unless you do that. Yeah, we'll we'll take questions over on the side here. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you.